This is Pastor Warren Hoyt from Beverly Hills Community Church. And uh, today I want to bring you a message about the triune nature of God. Yesterday was Trinity Sunday, so I preached that, uh, this message in our church yesterday. We had some problems with the video recording of it, so I'm just doing it again for those of you who didn't make it or those of you who live in other places. I want to talk to you about the triune nature of God. The Trinity is one of the most basic doctrines of Christianity, and yet it's really beyond human comprehension. Some people use that to say, therefore, it's, it can't be right. But let's face it, God is beyond human comprehension. And if you think you can figure God all out, then you misunderstand what the concept of God even means. Nevertheless, someone has said we can apprehend the doctrine of the Trinity, but we can't fully comprehend it. And if you look up apprehend, one of the meanings of it is to perceive. And so, and so, yeah, we can perceive the Trinity from what's revealed about God in Scripture, but we can't fully understand it. Nevertheless, it's really highly significant that we understand something of the Trinity because it's something for which we can be, be just amazed. It's something to marvel at. It's something to praise our God for, the Trinity. It really is. Last week, I brought a message about the difference that the Holy Spirit makes, and even in that message, I mentioned that the Father sent the Son and sent the Spirit to empower Him, and then uh, Jesus died for our sins, and that cleared the way for the Spirit to be given to us. But I mentioned the, the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Trinitarian nature, even in that message on the day of uh, Pentecost. But today, I want to focus more on the triune nature of God and, and um try to bring out a little bit of the ramifications of what that means for us in our lives. First, let me, let me begin by trying to clarify a few things that the Bible says about the Trinity and contrast them with some ideas people have that are erroneous. Um, we need to be sure we're not confused or saying confusing things, right? We don't believe, as some Muslims try to say, that the Trinity is the Father, God, the Mother, Mary, and Jesus. We don't believe in anything like that. That's absolutely not the biblical concept. Nor do we accept three different heresies about the Trinity that were uh, sort of developed in the early years of Christianity and are still with us today. These are Sabellianism, Arianism, and Tritheism. Sabellianism was developed by a guy named Sabellius. The idea was that the Trinity is really just three different modes. God expresses himself in three different modes. He expressed himself as Father in Old Testament days. He expressed himself as Son in Jesus' time. And then he expresses himself as the Holy Spirit today. But they're just modes of one God. We don't accept that. That today is um, uh, a doctrine that's held by people in a denomination called the United Pentecostal Church. Or if you see a church that says um, apostolic church or the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, most of them are believers in Sabellianism. God is just, it's called modalistic monarchianism. God uh, 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 revealed himself or, or manifested himself in three modes. Arianism is, is a doctrine that was started by a guy named Arius in the early uh, times of the church, and Arius said that there was God the Father, Jehovah, and that he created Jesus as a sort of a lesser God somewhere back in history, and then the Spirit is sort of the, the active force of God. That's with us today um, in the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's what they believe. Jesus is a lesser God. The Holy Spirit is just a force. Tritheism is with us today in Mormonism and some other some other doctrines, but it's the idea that Father, Son, and Spirit are, like, are actually three separate gods. And uh, you can be a god too if you're a Mormon. Someday you'll evolve to the place you'll be a god. The god that we have today used to be a man and so forth. So these are, these are false teachings, and there's always false cults and false religions attack the nature of God, and they have attacked the Trinity for centuries. And so to me, that kind of shows you that it must be important if Satan needs to distort it and attack it like that. It's a very, very, very crucial, important doctrine. Now, those are things we don't believe. Um, what do we believe? How do we describe the Trinity? First, you need to recognize this. The word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. And many uh, people will say, in fact, I watched uh, 
uh, a Muslim debating a Christian, and he said, you believe in the Trinity? Trinity's not even in your Bible. Well, it's not. But that's no problem. The concept is in the Bible. You know, in the, a lot of Christians believe in something called the rapture. Did you know that word's not in the Bible? We talk about Israel was a theocracy. That word's not in the Bible. The word theology that all of us study in seminary, uh, the people who are pastors study theology, and I recommend everybody should study theology. Theology's not in the Bible, but the concept is. <laughs> so, you know, what, what's the problem? Um, uh, for as far as it goes, Yahweh or Jehovah isn't in the Bible, not, not per se. The, name, the very names of God, they're not in the Bible. In the Bible, there's just four consonants. In English, it would be Y-H-W-H, and so we say that's Yahweh, and some people say, yeah, Jehovah, Jehovah, you know. But uh, it's actually not even there, you know. Uh, just the four consonants are there. And so, no, the word Trinity doesn't appear, but the concept of Trinity is really interwoven throughout the Bible. Now, <clears throat> first of all, we Christians are monotheists, just like uh, Jews, just like Muslims. And we know there's only one God. I Listen, everything I'm going to say today, I got like four or five scriptures for every point I make. So if you would like the notes and to have these scriptures, like if you need some of this verified, just send me an email and I'll be happy to send the, the notes to you so you can see that I'm backing everything up with scripture. But for this message, I don't have time to cover all the scriptures. But the Bible says clearly in both Old and New Testament that um, there is only one God, right? We are strict monotheists as Christians. However, that being said, there are also three distinct persons in the Bible who are called God. And that's clear too. Three distinct persons are called God. The Father is obviously called God. Well, when you pray our Father who art in heaven, everybody understands God is the Father, right? But what everybody doesn't understand, the cults don't understand, the Muslims don't understand, uh, the Son is also called God plainly in the Bible. I have a list of scriptures. I mean, I do whole teachings on that. The Son is called God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son is called God. And in addition, the Spirit is called God very clearly. I talked about that some in the last message last week. The Spirit is called God. You, you know, you can't lie to a force. The Bible tells us that uh, some people lied to the Spirit. That tells us that the Spirit spoke and, and, uh, and so forth. So Father, Son, and Spirit are called God. So there's three distinct persons called God. Now, how do we know they're distinct persons and not the same person, as uh, the Jesus-only people would say. How do we know that they're distinct persons? Well, we know that because of the way the Scripture speaks about the relationship and the interaction that they have among themselves as the persons. The Bible clearly shows this. There's an interaction. There's a relationship between the three persons of the Godhead. For example, the Bible tells us the Father sent the Son. He didn't send himself. Um, the Father said in the scripture I read there a minute ago, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So he was pleased with him. He loved the Son, the scripture tells us. There are scriptures that where it says that Jesus loved the Father. And that's why he went to the cross, because he loved the Father. The Son um, prayed to someone. The Je Jesus only people tell you he prayed to the God nature within, but that doesn't that seem like a stretch? He prayed to someone. He said, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me to the Father? He spoke to him. They related, right? Um, he obeyed the Father. Uh, then Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to send you another comforter. And the word another there in Greek means another like me. Not, I'm not going to send you me. I'm sending you another comforter. And the Bible says when Jesus ascended, he, uh, the Spirit proceeded from the Father through the Son, and he poured out the Holy Spirit upon people. The Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's not at the right hand of himself, right? Jesus said nobody comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said, uh, at one point, he said, Father, glorify your son. 
And the father spoke and said he had glorified and would glorify him again. So the father glorified the son. The son glorified the father. The spirit was going to come and he was going to glorify Jesus. And so uh, these interactions between the three persons, this way of expressing this, um, just clearly shows that they're three distinct persons, not the same persons. Um, I love the benediction verse. I'll read it to you, you know, and uh, I did this for the benediction uh, at the conclusion of the service Sunday. But in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul said, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you see three persons, distinct persons, right there in one scripture. Why would that be? It would be chaotic. It would, it would be incoherent. It would make no sense at all if the three persons were the same person. And you know, every one of his epistles, just about, Paul starts off by saying, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, they're, they're three distinct persons. And yet, the three distinct persons are not three gods. Because the scripture is very clear, very adamant, that there's only one God. And the three persons of the Godhead are not the same as three persons among human beings. Even my wife and I, the Bible says we're one, right? We become one in the sight of God, but she has different DNA than me. She's female and I'm male, so we're not the same person just because we're one. And even if you had triplets who were born of the same mother and father, they're still three separate human persons. And so the three persons of the Godhead are not like that. They're not like three separate, complete, different people with distinct DNA and all that. Because the church creeds that were developed over the early centuries of the church's existence, the, our, our founding, fa uh, the church fathers, if, fathers, if you will, were very clear in writing out and hammering out their definitions. And they said that the three persons were all of the same substance. And they were uh, completely together in all they do, in complete harmony and unity. And uh, so that word substance, you know, it sounds like a, to us, it's, it's, a, it's our English word. And uh, it's, it sounds like a, you know, a liquid or a solid or a gas or something, a substance, right? But uh, that's not what it means. God doesn't have a material substance like that. But it's a word for the substance, that which stands under. It's, it's a word for, that means the being of the Father, Son, and Spirit is one. And I can't explain what being is. I just know I'm a human being. You are too. And God is the supreme being. And so his being, his very uh, nature, his essence, if you will, uh, the essence of Father, Son, and Spirit is one. And so the three, they're three persons, but they're one God. They constitute together the one God, the Godhead. And so uh, a proper definition of the Trinity would be something like this. Within the nature of the one true God, there are three distinct persons, coexistent, co-equal, and co-eternal. The three persons are all of the same substance or essence, and the three persons all constitute the one true and living God. That's a, you know, it's a good working definition. If you want more detail, just Google the Athanasian Creed because it was a lot about the Trinity. Athanasius was one of the church fathers in the early years and they battled this out, you know, uh, in church councils and so forth. And Athanasius, uh, he's credited with the Athanasian Creed, which helps to explain uh, the Trinity. So you could look that up. It's important. Now, but look at, here, here's something you got to know. Why did Athanasius and these church councils and these church fathers, why did they come up with these creeds and with this idea of Trinity? You'll hear today, the cults will tell you, that the Roman Catholic Church invented the doctrine of the Trinity and they got it from pagan ideas. Folks, it's just simply not true. The ch early church hammered out and articulated and clarified the doctrine of Trinity because God revealed himself to man, manifested himself to man in time and space, in history, as a Trinity. That's why we believe in it. 
Nobody invented it. The Roman Catholic Church didn't even exist when the idea of the Trinity was first brought up. It was just one church. And it was brought, it was, it was, it was developed because it was necessity. <laughs> the early Christians were all monotheistic Jews. They had no idea of a Trinity. But God came to them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it actually took them a couple centuries or more to kind of wrestle with what had happened. I think of like the Lone Ranger, you know? He would uh, come through a town and do everything, you know, and save the town and all. And at the end of the show, he'd leave and ride off and somebody would say, who was that masked man? And uh, it's funny, yesterday when I said this, all the people out there in the pews were wearing their masks because of COVID-19. I said, the masked man was wearing his mask because of the virus. But anyway, um, when the Lone Ranger would ride away, that people would say, who was he? And they'd say, well, I don't know, but he left this silver bullet, you know? Think about this, folks. It's kind of like that with the Lord Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. God came to the people of the first century in Christ. He walked among them. They called him Emmanuel, God with us. And so after he died and rose again and everything, they, they were confused, you know? He asked them one time, who do people say I am and who do you say I am? And, and Peter said, you're the son of God. So they got that. They understood that to some extent, but man, they didn't understand so many things. They didn't know why he had to die. Then he rose again. They, they kind of had to learn about that. So when Jesus left and he poured out his spirit, you got to understand these monotheistic Jews, they only had, had been, in, it been ingrained in them that there's only one God. And so they're a strict monotheist, but what do you do with Jesus? What do you do with the Holy Spirit? Because the things Jesus said and did right there with them indicated he was more than a man, that he was God. I mean, they worshiped him. He accepted worship. <clears throat> he forgave sins. He calmed the storm. He walked on water. He gave sight to the blind. He raised the dead. They had to wrestle with this. And so they said, look, he's God. He had to be God. And then when the Spirit was poured out and they had this experience of the Spirit of God, He spoke to them. He rebuked them. Some people in the book of Acts, they lied to Him and they were killed. You can't lie to some force. And so the early Christians articulated, and you know, they didn't invent, but they hammered out, discussed, and articulated the doctrine of the Trinity because it was the only way to make sense of what God had done. See, God reveals himself. He reveals himself in nature. He reveals himself in the scriptures, but he also reveals himself in history. He came to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai and gave them the Torah. And he came to the world in the Lord Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So that's where the doctrine of the Trinity came from. And and, you know, the apostles and others, uh, the, the, the writers, there were eight or seven or eight authors of the New Testament. They wrote those scriptures under the inspiration of the Spirit within 30, 40, 50 years of the death of Christ. And so then the next century or two or three, the Christians had to wrestle with those writings as well and, and Old Testament scriptures as well. And so the only way to make sense of what they saw there was the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, it's, it's just interwoven in the scripture. In fact, it's so prevalent in the scripture that if you want to deny the Trinity, you got to basically change the scripture. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses have their own version, the New World Version of the Bible. That's why the Muslims just use the Quran. That's why the Book of Mormon, you know, was written. You got to get rid of the real scriptures because Trinity is there and they don't like the Trinity and they want to refute it. And so, you know, Trinity is a reality of God. And that's why I say to Jewish folks who don't believe in Jesus, I feel sorry for you because you can't really know God without the Son of God and the Spirit of God and understanding Trinity because that's how he's revealed himself in history. And so you don't, you don't know much about God. You don't really know the true God until you see how he has manifested himself in history. Besides this, what's really important to understand for all Christians is that um, our understanding of the Trinity affects how we see spiritual truth of all kinds and, and especially how we see and understand our salvation. 
It's very, very crucial to have the doctrine of the Trinity when you look at our salvation. For example, look at, if the Trinity is not true, and if, uh, you know, Jesus, we believe Jesus is God, then God died on the cross, right? Well, who was running the universe for those three days that he was in the grave? If God in his totality died on the cross, we believe Jesus was God, right? But did God die? But if he's not God, as Jehovah's Witnesses say, well then, how could his sacrifice be truly sufficient for us? Because only, uh, you know, only God could have lived a sinless life so that he could be worthy as a sacrifice. You know, you have to, he had to die for us. If he had his own sin, then he wouldn't be able to die for us. He'd have to die to pay for his own sin. So he had to be divine to overcome sin and live a perfect life and then die as a substitute for us. But at the same time, he had to be a man because the sentence of death was upon humankind and a man had to die to pay the penalty. Jesus had to take our penalty, so he had to be fully a man. So, so, you know, how do you understand this without the idea of Trinity and without the idea of Jesus being fully God? If Jesus wasn't fully God, then God didn't come to earth to save us, right? God didn't come to earth to save us. He just sent an underling, a lesser God, to die for us. Or he sent a perfect man or, or something, a prophet to die for us. He didn't, he didn't come himself. You see the ramifications of that? Then our God doesn't know what it's like to live on earth. He doesn't know what it's like to suffer. But no, we believe Jesus was fully God. God came. God bore the penalty for our sins. God knows what it's like to suffer. And if there's no Trinity, who did Jesus pray to? I already said, you know, the Jesus only people say he prayed to the God nature within himself. But doesn't that sound foolish? I mean, come on. He prayed to somebody. Why did he say nobody comes to the Father but by me? If there's not, you know, two persons there at least. Why does the Bible say God lives in us? In many scriptures, like I say, I got scriptures for every one of these points. If the Spirit's really the impersonal, active force of God, then God doesn't live in us. God doesn't live in us. See the ramifications of the Trinity? It's crucial. It's crucial to understand spiritual life and to understand salvation and understand the nature of God. I'll tell you what else, too, and this one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to amplify a bit in a few more minutes, but this is one of the most important things to get from the doctrine of the Trinity. If there's no Trinity... How could God be love? The Bible says God is love. Not just that he's loving or that he has love. God is love. But folks, how could God be love if there's no Trinity? You say, why is that important? Hey, love is something that's done between people, right? Persons have to love one another. God has existed for all eternity. We're just a blip on the radar. We've only been here a few, you know, thousand years. It's nothing compared to eternity. God's existed from all eternity. If God from all eternity was just one unipersonal being, there was nobody for him to love, no one to love him back. God could not be love. That's huge. So the Trinity means God has always been a community in and of himself. And the holy community of the Trinity has always loved and always been loved. And so I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, you know, we could spend weeks looking at the Trinity in Scripture. I took an entire seminary course on it. I loved it. It was a very good course. And uh, there are just so many places in Scripture that speak of Trinity. You know, I don't have time. I can't get into it all now. Send me an email. I'll send you the notes. But for example, why did God say, let us make man in our image and uh, other places in the Old Testament, it says us when God is speaking, let us and so forth. Why does it say in Psalm 2, serve the Lord and kiss the Son? Why does Psalm 33, 6 say God created the world by his word and his spirit? Why does Proverbs 30 say what is God's name and what is his son's name? Why does Isaiah 48, 16 say God sends his messenger and his spirit Psalm 45 is really a good one. Jehovah's Witnesses have to change this one completely in their Bibles. Because in, in, in the real original manuscripts and in our English Bibles, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee. So you got God talking to God and God anointing God. And 
What's that about? And then Psalm 110, same thing. The Lord said to my Lord. Jesus even asked this question. He says, who was David talking about when he said the Lord said to my Lord? And the Jews were dumbfounded. They didn't know. But how could there be two lords? The, the, the Shema says, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Adonai Elohenu, the Lord, our God. Adonai Echad, one Lord is. So there's one Lord, but yet this Psalm 110 says, the Lord said to my Lord. What's that about? Daniel 7 is one of my favorites. There you have the Ancient of Days in heaven. Daniel sees this vision. The Ancient of Days is God the Father on his throne, and there's brought before him one like the Son of Man. An obvious picture of Jesus being brought before the throne, and to this Son of Man is given dominion over all the nations of the earth, and they will all worship him and serve him forever. What is that? You got two divine beings in heaven? You're worshiping the Son of Man right in the presence of the Ancient of Days? Isn't that... Wow, I mean, what does that mean? See, Trinity is throughout even the Old Testament. In the New Testament, of course, I already read you some scriptures to begin with. And, you know, one of the best ones there was... Uh, the Trinitarian blessing that I that I said, you know, may the grace of God and the love of the, of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. You know, it's just throughout. And I'm just giving you a smattering of scriptures. But it, the, the, the teaching of Trinity is, is like interwoven throughout. And so that's why we believe in it. And it's not a, 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 um, something on the side, just a little uh, theological... Uh, excursion or side issue. No, it's interwoven in the scripture. It's a revelation of God. It's who God is. Now, the important thing is, how does that affect our lives practically day to day? How does the Trinity, what, what implications does it have for our lives? Well, I alluded to what I think is the primary one already, but I just want to expand it a little bit here. God's triune nature is kind of the basis for so many things, it's the it's it has huge ramifications for our lives as individuals and as the church and how we look at the world and everything, um, especially the concept of love and the concept of relationships. Let me read you a kind of a long quote from Pastor Timothy Keller. I really respect him. I taught his book, The Reason for God, and this comes from that. Let me just read that to you. He says, if there's no God, then everything in and about us is the product of blind, impersonal forces. The experience of love may feel significant, but evolutionary naturalists tell us that it's merely a biochemical state in the brain. Okay, so atheism says that love is really a biochemical state in the brain. You think you love, but it's just, you know, molecules. But what if there is a God, he says. Okay, does love fare any better? Well, it depends on who you think God is. If God is unipersonal, then until God created other beings, there was no love, since love is something that one person has for another. This means that a unipersonal God, that would be Allah of the Muslims, even the God of Judaism, a unipersonal God was power, sovereignty, and greatness from all eternity, but not love. Hope you get this. Love, then, is not the essence of God, nor is it at the heart of the universe. Power is primary. See? Because how could God be loved from all eternity? He, he wasn't. However, if God is triune, then loving relationships in community are the great, quote, fountain at the center of reality, unquote. Loving relationships and community is the very, like, fountain of life. When people say God is love, I think they mean that love is extremely important or that God really wants us to love. But in the Christian conception, God really has love as his essence. If he was just one person, he couldn't have been loving for all eternity. See the importance of Trinity? If he was only the impersonal all-soul of Eastern thought, he couldn't have been loving, for love is something that persons do. Eastern religions believe the individual personality is an illusion, and therefore love is too. Chesterton wrote, For the Buddhist, personality is the fall of man. For the Christian, it's the purpose of God, the whole point of his cosmic idea. 
It's the purpose of God because he's essentially, eternally, interpersonal love. Ultimate reality is a community of persons who know and love one another. That is what the universe, God, history, and life is all about. Do you see how important the Trinity is? He goes on to say, if you favor money, power, and accomplishment over human relationships, you'll dash yourself on the rocks of reality. So this is the importance, you know, of Trinity. God is love only because God is triune. And Trinity means love is the center of the universe. Love is the ultimate goal. It's the ultimate reason for everything. Because God is triune, God is love. So when he made us, he didn't make us because he needed somebody to love. Like Grace Slick says, don't you want somebody to love? You know, he didn't need us. He's not a co-dependent God. He didn't make us to love him because he needs our love. Nobody else loves him. He's lonely, so he made... I've even heard Christians say this. God was lonely, so he made us. No. The Trinity teaches us God is absolutely, completely at one with himself. God is a loving community in himself. He is completely... Uh, uh, sufficient, self-sufficient. He doesn't need us at all. He just made us in order to expand his love. Just like a man and a woman, if they love to eat one another and they come together, their family expands and they have children. This is a picture of God. He's created us because, and he's made a universe that's expanding outward because God is expanding in his love toward one another. He wants to include us in this loving relationship of the triune God. He didn't create us to get the joy of love. He created us to share his love, to share his very nature. Think about it, friends. That's why the greatest commandments that there are are the two that say you should love God, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Enter into the love of the Trinity. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Though, those commandments align us with the very nature of God. He's love, see? If we don't love God, if we don't learn to love, you know, to love him, to love others, then we miss the whole point of the universe because it was made to express his love. So as I close today, just think of the ramifications this has for life, you know? It shows us the very purpose of life, the very essence of the the very heart of the universe. Uh, as Christians, we're to love one another. What good is it if we bitterly fight and are divided with one another? We're missing the whole point. As, as Christians, we understand the ramifications this has for marriage and family. God created man and woman to love one another, to love their children, to, to take care of one another as he, as the members of the Trinity, mutually love one another and so forth. Marriage is sort of a picture of that, even when it says that, you know, we're the bride of Christ, he marries us, and we become one with him, one spirit with him, and so on. It's a picture, again, an extension of the love of the Trinity. The Trinity, the love of the Trinity is kind of the basis for evangelism and for missions. God sent his son to, because he loved the world, he wanted to save the world, he wanted to reconcile the world. He empowered him in his mission, and then Jesus poured out the Spirit on us to empower us in, us, in, in our mission so that we could go forth and tell people of God's love and bring them into the family of the Trinity, right? Evangelism, missions, that's just the outworking of the very nature of God, the Trinity. It's the very outworking of, of love, right? And so uh, the Trinity is just so very important, and uh, you know, I believe in this time of riots and everything that we're experiencing in our country, the division, the bitterness, the fighting, and so forth, it's because we're alienated from God, from the life of God. And and so uh, we, we fight and divide. And what God wants is to bring reconciliation, but it can't happen without Him. Because His nature is that reconciliation and that love, and we our nature is not. And so we're fallen. We need to be united with God. That's our only hope of unity, that we're just become one in Christ, as Christ is one with the Father and the Spirit. And so, look, at, there's no other religion like the teaching of Christ, 
the teaching of Trinity. No other, no other religion has a God like that who is triune, who is all loving, who is all community and so forth. It's the beautiful, beautiful truth. It's, of course it's beyond our human comprehension. God is beyond our human comprehension. But the thing is, it's something for which to glorify God. Something that we are to marvel at. Something we are to model, we are to follow and, and seek to imitate and so forth. The, the love of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we understand they've done everything necessary to reconcile us and to bring us into that fellowship of love that they are. And so, uh, as I close, let me just read the scripture to you that I read a little while ago as a kind of a benediction over you. And I pray that this will edify you and build you up as you think about the very nature of our marvelous God, eternal God, the eternal triune God. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.